we go. Great. All right, ladies, can you hear me okay? Yes. All right, fantastic. We're going to go ahead and get started this morning. Welcome to all of our attendees. I know we have a number of people who are going to continue to be joining us, but I want to be mindful of your time. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and um, do a little bit of a quick uh, set of uh, housekeeping things and then uh, get right to our conversation this morning with these uh, two extraordinary Floridians that we're so, uh, so thankful to, to have with us today. And we're so um, just so blown away by the work that they do uh, here in our state. So good morning, all. We are in our third week of our volunteer engagement leadership series for October. And we have had such a fantastic turnout. I know many of you joining have joined us in some of our other um, uh, sessions over the last couple of weeks. We've just had some extraordinary speakers. I've heard some great feedback from you all and from many of our other attendees uh, from the previous weeks. And uh, Volunteer Florida has just been so thrilled to be able to offer uh, an opportunity like this uh, to the field uh, over the last several weeks and into uh, next week. And good morning and hellos to all of you in the chat who are saying hi uh, to us. We always love to hear that. Um, lots of different focus areas and lots of different areas of the state that we're seeing hellos from, lots of familiar um, names and, um, and areas. So we're, we're really glad to have you today. All right, so I know most of you are, are very familiar with us, our dear friends uh, and partners of our organization, but just to remind you, we are the state's lead agency for volunteerism and national service. We're what's called a state service commission, and every state actually has an organization like ours, but we have uh, a reach that extends beyond national service, which we're proud uh, to have as part of the uh, the work that we do. We're also the, the lead agency for volunteers and donations before, during, and after disasters and have just a really tremendous emergency management department uh, that does that work as well as administer uh, the Florida Disaster Fund. You know, and we exist to, um, of course, administer national service, to foster volunteerism, um, to strengthen the communities across the state. And uh, we have the joy of doing that as a grant maker, as um, uh, an organization that has training and resources in, in many other ways. So that's just a quick reminder and then a little orientation for those of you who may not be familiar with us. And then in my department specifically, I really try to provide as much training and resources, um, as many resources as I can, um, build relationships, kind of connect people um, to what their needs might be uh, in the volunteer engagement field. I minister Volunteer Connect, which is our platform, um, our volunteer opportunities platform, and you'll be getting some more information about that uh, after our uh, conversation today. And, and what we want to see as an organization is what you all want to see. Floridians who are engaged and that Florida is a, is a better place to live, work, and play. So uh, we're just so glad, again, to be with you all this morning. Wanted to share this couple of things with you uh, before we get started. Uh, next week, just so as a reminder, we've got unique competencies and professional ethics for leaders of volunteers. And that's, um, we have a tremendous speaker for that. Please go to volunteerflorida.org you'll see our splash page for, um, for the leadership series and you can still register for that for next week. All right, and so today our executive round table, the pivotal role of volunteer engagement in thriving organizations. Um, really, really excited to have these two extraordinary ladies with us this morning and I can't um, um, overemphasize, can't possibly overemphasize how glad, it is, glad I am that they were willing to take an hour out of their day to do this with us today. So we have Elizabeth Simonton, Simonton, is that okay? Is that properly said? Um, who is with ICU Baby in South Florida. She's the co-founder and the CEO, and I'm going to share a little bit with you about her. And she's a co-founder and CEO, again, of ICU Baby, which is the largest volunteer-based organization in Florida that supports families with a baby in the neonatal intensive care unit. Elizabeth is an attorney and former small business owner who started the NICU Families Fund when, with her husband in 2014 after having a NICU experience of her own. ICU Baby was developed in 2015 to broaden and extend the mission of the NICU Families Fund. And then quickly, Elise Cornelison. 
I know these ladies so well, but we just go by first names. So then I don't ever think, how do they pronounce their first names? Because <laughs> they're just your colleagues by first name. Um, so Elizabeth had 17 years of experience, where uh, Elise had 17 years of experience working with nonprofits. Um, her previous nonprofit work solidified her dedication to make sure children of all ages are given every educational opportunity. And she joined uh, Junior Achievement Big Bend um, in 2018 which is a continuation of our commitment to help educate, educate the next generation. And this time to learn about financial literacy and empowering them to own their own economic success. They're gonna be telling you a good bit more about themselves. So I just, want to, um, just wanted to give you that quick orientation to them. So finally, all done with that. Elizabeth, welcome. You mm -hmm. unmute. We would love to hear more about you personally, who you are. Uh, we'll get into who you are professionally in just a second, but just tell us a bit about yourself. Sure. Good morning. Well, thanks so much for having me on this morning. I've been looking forward to this. Jovita knows I love volunteers and volunteerism, and uh, and so thank you for having me. Um, so I live here in Brickell, which is um, in Miami, and I have three children, 11, 10, and 8. Um, I'm an avid runner and I really spend most of my time working, <laughs> to be honest, because it's a very small organization here in the city, but I also um, spend a lot of time with my kids. I'm oftentimes seen at the sidelines of soccer games, golf tournaments, uh, all for them, um, to be honest. So um, that's basically who I am uh, personally. And, um, but, but truly, I also like to give back to other organizations in addition to ICU Baby. Um, so that's really how I spend my time. Well, thank you, Elizabeth. And Elise, tell us a bit about yourself. Yes. Hi. Hi, everybody. Hi, Dorita. Thank you so much for having me on this morning. Been looking forward to this ever since you, you reached out. So thank you. A um, little bit about me. I am a mom of two. Um, one's 26, one's 28. So there is hope. There is the tunnel, the light at the end of the tunnel, they do make it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, uh, and so, but, uh, so when I said this time um, that it was to empower the next generation for their own economic success was previously, I was an archaeologist and I was in, uh, worked in the uh, nonprofit world for both the state and uh, history type um, backgrounds. So um, I had a, I had most of my years working, you know, promoting history sites. Uh, things that I love to do. I am a bonsai enthusiast, artist, and um, you know you don't run into those very often. But it was Ben <laughs> and I picked up and. I uh, love it. Um, my volunteerism uh, really started with my kids um, when they were doing their sports with their schools, you know, with their clubs, <clears throat> I would volunteer. And that's really how I got involved in, you know, really appreciating what volunteers do because I know how much work I did. And then with my work, I also saw how much our other volunteers also did to help promote and make you know our organizations run smoothly. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, and I know that so much, as you're saying, uh, at least for both of you, uh, comes from your own experiences, your personal experiences, um, volunteering. Um, and as Elizabeth, you said, you're involved with a number of other organizations. Um, probably the soccer and the the connecting in, the, in that way, but then other other um, organizations that you found to be powerful and beneficial that you wanted to support. Um, so I would love to hear a little bit about your organizations. Um, some of our attendees may be familiar and others may not. So um, I've got a couple of uh, pictures um, just as you guys share. Um, so Elizabeth, we'll start with you. Um, and uh, I know I mentioned very briefly the um, kind of founding story of ICU Baby, but would love to hear about your mission any sort of philosophies you have in general as an organization, and we'll go more deeply into um, kind of the strategic component um, that, that you consider volunteerism as we, as we go along. Sure, so ICU Baby, we like to say, was born, 
quote unquote, with, with the birth of my son. And um, he's my third child. Um, and my first two pregnancies were very easy and very smooth. And my children came home kind of in the natural course of things, as we like to say in ICU baby. And so um, when my son was in the unit, um, I saw the, the, the medical care here in South Florida just being so incredible and really renowned in the world. Um, but what I didn't see was a, a big base of support for the families that were really enduring this medical journey with their newborn baby. And so, of course, with a newborn baby and two little ones at home, I certainly didn't set out to start a nonprofit, but um, I wanted to give back like all of us do when we have a, a significant experience in our life. Um, particularly those of us sitting on this call. Um, and so I went to the hospital and offered several ways of giving back, but the one that really stuck with them was to give back in the way of supporting families where we did see this void. Um, so ICU Baby was started very simply to support families with a baby in the NICU. Um, and that mission has really evolved in many ways. I mean, support means so much. It's kind of a loose term that we all use in, in all of our work, but First, we started supporting the families emotionally by offering bedside support um, to the families that had a, an admitted NICU baby. We expanded that to start offering financial support um, to those families who couldn't afford to come from home to hospital to visit their baby. We tried to fill that gap and kind of reduce that barrier here in South Florida. And now we're launching into a new component, which is informational support. So now that a lot of us are behind the screens and, and, and also for our families not able to get into the NICU as regularly as they used to be because of visitation limitations um, occasioned by a COVID, we thought, well, let's bring the information about the NICU to them on demand. And so that's our newest program where we're trying to elevate health literacy, decrease some barriers in, in, uh, because of social determinants of health um, in order to support families that way. So it, it's a, our mission that's involved in our guiding principle, uh, as, as you asked, Jovita, really is to make sure parents feel supported in whatever way support, uh, what, whatever support they need during that time, which is very different. As we know, the NICU doesn't discriminate. It can happen to everyone. Um, and so we just like to meet everyone where they are and meet them with the needs that they have during that really difficult time. Thank you so much uh, for sharing that. And as you can see in just these pictures, people connecting, these little ones, the most vulnerable, you know, among us, it's just extraordinary the work that you all are doing and uh, your willingness and vision and foresight to, to begin um, a work like this in your community. So we're, we're just so thankful for everything that you do. And, Thank you for that overview. I know there's so much more <laughs> than the kind of an initial elevator speech, but um, thank you for, for sharing that. And um, I know a couple of people are having problems with audio and another uh, another set of folks, or I think a lot of people, it's, it's also okay. So um, we will see if there's um, anything we can figure out on our end um, um, to, to help with that. Um, and just let us know specifically, I think you said the panelists, so I'm not being able to hear Elizabeth. So we'll keep working on that and see if we can figure, figure that out for you all. So we, we see you and hear you. All right, Elise, um, a little bit about um, Junior Achievement uh, Big Bend, and then of course the broader organization, which a number of people may be familiar that you all are, you all, are all over. Uh, so if you'll share some with us about, about, um, about JA. Sure. So JAUSA is the world's oldest and largest organization giving K through 12 uh, grades the skills they need to own their economic success and plan for their future and make smart academic and economic choices. Um, JA Big Ben's volunteer delivered programs foster uh, readiness, entrepreneurship, and financial literacy school, uh, skills and use experimental learning to inspire students and our community to dream, dream big and reach their potential. Um, by inspiring personal economic success, JA's vision for students is to become prepared workers and leaders who provide higher standards of living in their communities, their state and their nation. Um, and annually here in Leon County and Gaston and Jefferson counties, uh, we reach about 30, we've reached about 30,000 students since our inception in 20, 
16. So that usually runs about 3,000 students each school year. And as you can see on the board, you can see that we have um, volunteers in the classroom. Uh, we also have uh, volunteers that um, help us judge our shark bowl. And uh, so volunteers are very much uh, embedded and in, in based in our in all that we do. Um, <clears throat> so uh, just to, to show you, I mean, just to let you know a little bit more is that um, previously to the pandemic, we had um, our volunteers uh, go in with paper-based kits that would be then shared within the classroom. But when the pandemic hit, we uh, luckily were able to revert our programs over to virtual base. And now um, we have the ability to have our volunteers beam in uh, to the classroom and present the program or um, actually be in the, in the program, as you can see in the one picture there, uh, and also use the uh, virtual programming uh, to make sure that all students are not passing things around and being able to pass those germs around that we're all dealing with. So uh, that is a little bit about JA. Like uh, Jovita said, we are uh, a nation, national and worldwide. But for um, here in America, we have 107 area offices. Uh, part of that here in Florida, you will probably have heard of us in Naples and Miami, Orlando, Tampa, and Jacksonville, Pensacola. Uh, J.A. Big Bend is a satellite office off of Jacksonville, the office in Jacksonville, J.A. in North Florida. Um, and so we are, are responsible for Leon County and our rural counties around us. Thank you, Elise. <clears throat> so it, it's neat to have both of you, one with um, a, a really well-established longtime organization uh, that is, is international in its influence and then this grassroots organization um, in South Florida, it doesn't necessarily have that, that same kind of history, both of you um, having a, a tremendous uh, type of insight, both organizations uh, valuing uh, volunteerism as a strategy as opposed to just a program. And so we'll go ahead and get into those types of, um, that type of conversation. So um, Elizabeth, some specifics uh, from you about how um, both volunteers are mobilized to meet your mission. You know, not just um, kind of the description of it, but really how it, um, how their, their work, um, is an extension of and really catalyzes what you do. And what do you hear about that from you? Sure. First, we have to laugh about the audio because I'm in the center of Brickell, Miami, <laughs> downtown Miami. So if it's spotty service, I apologize. And I'm sorry some of you can't hear me. I've moved a little closer to the screen. So hopefully we can remediate that. But volunteers really are the backbone of ICU Baby. Um, they are our structure. They are the reason that we have grown. Um, for any... Uh, organization on the call that's smaller and a startup, what we'll really find is that there's not the budget to sustain a staff to carry out programs. So you're looking for volunteers just to start out. And I think this applies to the bigger organizations also as they try to expand their programming. You're looking, um, you know, you're looking to utilize and leverage those community members who are passionate about your mission just to build that. So for us, I mean, I was a volunteer for four years, uh, working 40 hours a week, getting us off the ground. Um, and we've, what we've done now is really utilize volunteers, not only to carry out our programs, to help us within in-house, so to speak, with professional um, uh, needs that we identify, but we've used volunteers um, and their skills to explore what other programs we can move into. So for example, um, one of the strongest volunteer teams we have are the volunteers that go into the hospital prior to COVID, now they're telesupport. Um, and these are families who have had NICU experiences themselves calling the families 
that are in the hospital and providing them with that emotional support. That team is 27 big. I do not have it in the budget to hire 27 uh, professionals in that capacity. So that program of ours is 100% volunteer based, led by a, a staff member, of course. Um, and you can imagine the impact of that program on these families year after year. In fact, just since telesupport, I pulled some numbers, um, since telesupport started at the start of the pandemic, these volunteers have logged 612 hours of supporting families in our local NICUs. That's just incredible impact by pe people that are passionate about the cause. Um, and the other way we really leverage volunteers as a small organization is um, in the utilization of episodic volunteers. So these are our corporations that are coming in and saying, hey Beth, we care about your mission. Um, how, how can we help? And you know, we ha we're lucky enough because of Volunteer Florida funding to have a volunteer coordinator. So she and I put our heads together and we never like to create a project that we don't need. We don't wanna make anyone busy for the purpose of making them busy. We wanna make sure that they're coming in to do a high impact project for us. And our, our hope is that it has high impact for them knowing the outcomes. Um, and so these episodic volunteers have totally carried out another project of ours, which is our NICU pack program. Um, they're the ones that are packing um, the care packages we send into the hospital that allow these families to have some of the tools they need, some of the resources they need to care for their baby well admitted. Um, that's entirely volunteer based. And, and over the course of our time as a, a, a grantee for Volunteer Florida, with these volunteer hours, this number is astounding. So I, I have to share. 20,467 hours have been logged in three years by volunteers sustaining our program. And that has allowed IC Baby to grow exponentially, as you can imagine, in the last six, six years and really um, impact thousands of families here in South Florida. Our budget did not allow us to do that. So it was the people power that volunteer offers that really brought us across that line. And I attribute volunteers to allowing our organization to grow. I love <clears throat> all of that, especially, and my head going this way is because I'm writing furiously, not because I'm not paying attention. I'm looking over at our, our lovely Audrey and Olivia who are assisting today. Um, you know, high impact and not busy work, not finding something to do just to give somebody something to do, which takes up not only that person's time, but also the staff member's time who's trying to, to figure out how best to keep a volunteer busy and then um, sustaining your programs, as well as the expansion and broadening of, of potential other programs. And that really, you know, when we think about um, hours of volunteers and numbers of volunteers, those, those numbers really can mean a whole lot of things. You can have a lot of volunteers who are spinning their wheels in that 20,000 hour number. Or you can say, which you're able to, we have the volunteers, all of whom are contributing to the, the sustainability, the growth, the impact of our organization. So those are very weighted hours, as opposed to, you know, hours that are just sort of slipping through the hands of people who can be a kind of human capital for you that is indispensable and ultimately just so powerful for your clients, um, the individuals you support. It's so true. I mean, I think that we have so much to do. <laughs> Honestly, yeah. we use many more volunteers. We're recruiting right now. Um, we have so much to do that it has to be weighted work, as you say. It really does. It's the only way we can get across the finish line. And um, and we are a small team doing mighty work for small right. small members of our community. <laughs> right. we really need that. Right. <laughs> and the storytelling aspect, and then Elisa, I want to ask you the same the question, is so you know, important because, you know, we, I think a lot of organizations, for example, have um, um, kind of material goods they may be putting together or packing, or, you know, I think you were talking about the kits just now. And, you know, people, a lot of times in their minds, it's it, how you couch and help to frame to pe for people why doing that is so important. So I'm putting together you know, a hundred hygiene kits in an hour. And to me, it's sort of, I could put my headphones in and do it as a volunteer. And, and in my mind, I'm not necessarily connecting to how vital that is going to be to somebody else, someone experiencing homelessness that we give a toothbrush to or a toothpick, you know, whatever the thing is um, that, that may be occurring. So how we um, make sure the volunteers know 
what their impact is, like what happens down the line from what they're doing if they're not on those front lines. Like for example, your telesupport folks, but everything you say, the way that you speak about it, and this is one of the reasons I just adore you, is, is that it is that impact, it is that sustainability, and there's not, um, there's a sense of importance and urgency when you talk about what volunteers are doing in your organization, as opposed to what we often say here, that they're kind of this nice but unnecessary um, um, group of individuals who are supporting your organization. So I just, um, I think that the, the semantics, the words, the stories that we use to tell that truth are, you know, that's just so critical. Um, so with Elise, with you, <laughs> I'll take a deep breath there, um, and uh, volunteerism in uh, junior achievement, uh, tell us a little bit about how those volunteers achieve um, um, the mission uh, of your organization and kind of what that weighted work is and the impact uh, there. Oh, sure. So um, uh, JA, uh, junior achievement, is basically wrapped around volunteerism. Uh, we use, as, as Volunteer Florida likes to use the term, skills-based volunteers. Um, so <laughs> we love that term. Um, so our volunteers are, are in the trenches. They're in the classroom. They're working with the students. Well, either beamed in or physically in the classroom, um, working with the students. So there is a one-on-one -on -one connection with um, the volunteer and the students, and they're working also with the teachers. So they are totally immersed in the mission of um, what JA is about. And um, that is you know, teaching financial literacy, teaching uh, entrepreneurship, and teaching um, uh, work readiness school, skills no matter whether it's in kindergarten or all the way up to um, 12th grade. So even though we're a staff here in, in Tallahassee of only two, um, we uh, have a, a full team of 200 uh, volunteers that will go into the classrooms uh, or after school programs to actually teach um, these programs that are, are coming to us from JAUSA that are vetted, they're put before age appropriate teachers and everything that is that can be possibly researched with it before it actually goes out to the students. So um, there is no hardly any <laughs> um, putting packets together or, you know, administrative work because we really need them in the classroom, bringing their, their examples, their life stories, their, um, you know, what they're in the middle of doing right now. So, I mean, I can give you a prime example. Um, we have a restaurant here in Tallahassee that the owner operator is volunteering for us, teaching our JAB entrepreneurial program in one of our high schools. And, you know, they are going over what a profit and loss statement is and what success looks like. He can bring his daily, um, his daily experience and show the, the kids exactly what it is that he is doing. It's a real life experience. Um, another experience is our bankers that we have on our board, which is another volunteer uh, example that we have with JA is not only our volunteers in the classroom, but they make up our board as well. And they help guide what we're doing in the community. So uh, our bankers, our financial institutions that we have on our board, those uh, volunteers are very much into financial literacy and they know that our students are not getting that in school. And so they have a real big passion to also be able to go into the classroom and teach what it means to be, you know, financially stable, what it is just to give them the basics of what it is to, to learn about 
credit cards, uh, debit cards, checking accounts, how what to look for when you're doing shopping, you know, things like that, that they are just not getting these days. So our, our volunteers, when we recruit, we look for those volunteers that have a passion, um, just like Elizabeth does. Uh, look for those volunteers that have a passion to be in the classroom and to give their experience to those students. And that's great. And I, <clears throat> I think you, you know, some of the examples that you all are giving are really great um, compliments to each other because there are people who their, their full-time job is something they want to layer into volunteering. They want to parlay into volunteering. Entrepreneurship, that is probably something that you are doing or have done that you're going to be teaching about or a banker. But then you have um, people who maybe had an experience like Elizabeth is talking about. You have an experience that you want to relay or connect um, um, to others, you know, in terms of your motivation. Sometimes it's expertise, sometimes it's experience and your own personal um, um your own personal experiences with things. And then it also can be that you have people who don't wanna do anything related to their nine to five. And they still have a place if they have, you know, if you have a, a way for them to serve and they have um, a passion or an interest, you can marry those things. Um, we, we also have, and I don't know, um, just in terms of, um, recruitment and, and placement and connection. I think both of you have had some conversations with about this, but you know, you do have people who come in and their motives uh, could be anything. It can be that somebody needs volunteer hours. It could be that they want to pay it forward. It could be, um, oh my gosh, I just got to get out of my bubble. Um, so many different reasons why people come in. Um, but when you're looking at placing a volunteer in a space that is going to be beneficial for them and more importantly for your clients, because these are the, the individuals, whether they're two kids or the parents who um, you really want to make sure are well taken care of, appropriately taken care of, representing your organization well. You know, when you think about fit in that way, because this is something, you know, I think we've all kind of dealt with. Elizabeth, I'd start with you. You know, just when something isn't really working or, you know, the relationship is, is just not ideal or maybe the person should be in another space. I know you all do a lot of that relationship building with your volunteers. So I'd love to hear some about maybe how, how you um, kind of handle some of those realities, just working with people. Super. Yeah. I, when we spoke uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was telling Jovita that the real reason for our success in volunteerism, I think, is relationships. Um, absolutely. We do have a system that re allows us to kind of process volunteers that are interested in, in joining ICU Baby. That's a better impact system. But that is only like 20% of it. For me, a lot of times, if it's a project they'll be working on um, for an extended period of time, I carve out an hour to sit down with every volunteer. And it is time. It's time out of, out of my day for sure. But the exponential potential of that one hour conversation I've identified as being really cru crucial to a volunteer's success with us. So, and in that time, it's like you said, it's not only identifying what they can do, it's what do they want to do, right? What can they get out of this experience? What are their goals for the experience? And then how do they want to really have the reporting structure? How do they want to circle back about their success in the project? And we had an experience this summer where um, and, and like Elise, I don't give out a lot of administrative work to our volunteers because I don't find that there's a good retention rate in volunteerism when, that's hap when that happens. So um, we had handed a substantial project to a volunteer, very clearly setting forth our expectations of if this doesn't get done, it's going to really impact the work that we're doing in the hospital. So just letting them know how important they are, how important the work is, um, and how we had um, some deliverables with that particular work. Then um, talking with them about whether they can make that happen and communicating with them that if it can't happen, circle back with us. You know, you're, we're, you're, you have that liberty to say we can't move forward or I can't get this done. So our... Um, 
our particular volunteer had a family emergency and wasn't able to move forward with, with the project. So what that involved really was another one of those phone calls. It wasn't like a, hey, where's the work? They're volunteering, they're passionate, they came to you for a reason. It was more picking up the phone, that human side of managing people, managing volunteers who are really just um, a further extension of your team, it, particularly if you're valuing them the right way. And so when I got on the phone with her and we'd had a couple weeks of missed deliverables, it was a, you know a 30 minute conversation of the most raw emotion. She was disappointed in herself. She didn't want to call me because she was embarrassed. And mm -hmm. so we connected and that really set her up um, for a successful experience once the family emergency passed. And we really take that model of human connectivity and relationships and apply it to all the volunteers that are working with us week after week. A little harder to do when we're working with big groups, of course, we can't designate an hour. But in that case, what we try to do is uh, appoint a, a contact um, within that group and talk to that person about expectations and just having that real clear communication initially. And that way, if, if the volunteer opportunity isn't working out, those expectations have been made and it's not as uncomfortable to call back and say, hey, we thought you were gonna be doing this, uh, what's happening? Um, because they knew. <laughs> and, and a lot of times they have a great, a, you know, a really reasonable expectation. And then we just pivot. We have a, a volunteer from Tampa right now that's working with us. The first project didn't work out because of us, actually. It was a project that kind of fell through. So we pivoted, and she's now doing something very valuable for the organization um, and moving one of our programs forward very substantially. So I don't think a, a volunteer experience that doesn't go in a straight route is a dead end. I just think what we're also used to right now, the cliche word of the of the couple of years is pivot. You just pivot, <laughs> and move them, talk to them, and then move them to an assignment that's more that's more rewarding for them and more in lines with what their expectations were mm -hmm. along with the organizations. That's great. Thank you, Elizabeth. And again, the um, human connectivity, the relationship piece, <clears throat> you know, and I think the contrast to that is just a transactional dynamic. So what time should we be there? What should we wear? What should we bring with us? You know, that kind of information, maybe a brief info, you know, um, um, orientation about the organization, but really the relationship. And I love the idea of that contact within a larger group that, it, you know, we are realistic about our time being so limited. Um, and so uh, that is a great idea. And again, the point person not just being a logistics person about when we're going to show up and but that it is a relationship and what's going on, what their desire is, what the meaning is of what they're doing, what you're doing. Um, I think that that's huge and that kind of gets missed sometimes. Right. And one thing that we've done successfully because of Zoom, thank God, is that when we have bigger um, groups, I still talk to them, but I film it a lot in advance. So I'll film a Zoom with my VP of programming, I mean, and, and sometimes VP of, of volunteer engagement, we film it and we we send that personal message to those bigger groups of volunteers. So That's there's great. still that face, face interaction. And that has actually been very successful. We've got a lot of positive feedback about that. We can't be everywhere, but we certainly right. can film five minutes of a thank you and a hello and how this is gonna help. That's a great idea. I love that. Um, I'm gonna go back and then at least we'll touch base. Um, so a couple of really interesting things in the, um, the, the Q&A, um, but <clears throat> somebody was mentioning, um, you know, Elise, when you mentioned that volunteers don't do admin work, that they do, they're in the classroom. Um, and this individual just said, you know, I see, you know, with internships, kind of the opposite, you know, you know, do we think that interns should do busy work or should they be treated more like meaningful volunteers, especially when they're not paid? And I, I wanna clarify something real quickly um, you know, when I say meaningful and impactful, that includes clerical work. It includes all of those things because, um, for example, if, um, if I'm freed up as a staff member to do some of the other things I'm not able to get to, all our support services are critical to our organization, our, um, our IT folks, our um, admin assistants, our um, financial, so, you know, uh, it's not just programmatic, but they're right there on the front lines. You know, I was talking to somebody the other day about, and I say this a lot, you know, if, if, if you have somebody who comes in and they're really good at filing and doing database management, right? I am not great with Excel, okay? 
But if there's somebody who is good at that and able to do that, and it provides efficiency and effectiveness for my organization, that's really significant. So it's, and, and somebody may want to do that, right? So we assume that there are people who are just like, oh gosh, clearly this is not important, but if they're good at it, where they want to be able to free you up to do some other things, that is, I think, meaningful work. Now, it, it shifts a little bit with internships and expectations, but I think at least when you were talking about that, the idea was staff members are not the ones that need to be in the classroom sharing, the volunteers do, so you're kind of, you, you have to make sure that they're, the, they're doing that work, and so you're not giving them those things, not that those things aren't important. Am I... Correct. Oh, correct. For sure. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> we would never turn away a volunteer, but if it's a volunteer that would love to do admin work, sure, we would take them in a heartbeat. But our, um, Your model. our model is to have our volunteers, our skills-based volunteers in the classroom or on the board doing, um, you know, the heavy, heavy lifting and uh, just like with what Elizabeth was saying, you know, um, building those relationships to figure out where they're more comfortable is the key to making sure that the volunteer has a um, mean of meaningful, um, ex you know, meets the expectations that they're looking for. And uh, Elise, you mentioned, um just real quickly, you were talking about some of the rural areas and just um, some of the dynamics of getting volunteers to those areas, the kind of volunteers that you get, the shift there, which I think um, is, is um, go, you know, is perfect when we're talking about placement of volunteers. So that you may have an area where it isn't that the kids are, are, are inclined to be bankers, right? It doesn't mean they shouldn't be exposed to that. But right. that all of the, you know, you have uh, maybe a wealthier high school, they need to see the HVAC person just as much as they need to see the banker and, and vice versa in, in a rural area. So I know you, we talked about that and I thought that was really powerful as well as some of the presumptions that people might have about where a volunteer wants to work or, or where they want to support because of what they do versus not. So um, I don't know if you recall that, but we were talking about, mm -hmm. um, uh, and I would love for you to share that real quickly. Oh, sure. So um, yeah, so the, the, the rural communities around us, you know, tend to not uh, get the, uh, the information that they need. And so that's where uh, Volunteer Florida came in and was, was uh, helped us make those inroads to, uh, for us, Gaston County Jack and Jefferson County. But like you were saying, Jovita, that, um, you know, there may not be, uh, you know, uh, somebody in the class that is looking to become a banker or, uh, you know, something that you would think of in a more populous, County like Leon County, but you might have that that person in the classroom who's like, yeah, I really want to be a welder or want to be a plumber. So what does this have to do with me? Well, if they're going through entrepreneurship, you know, then they're like, okay, I I can go and I can learn to be a plumber, but then I I might want to start my own business because we don't have a a good plumbing company here in Jefferson County, so. We try to help those students make the connection as to why these programs are important to you. And uh, we also look at the volunteers in the same way. So in Gaston County, there is a, um, a, a person who owns a, a uh, communications company. And he is so involved in the community because he wants to make sure Gaston County um, is getting the information they need on entrepreneurship, also on financial literacy. So they help um, our, in the high schools teaching, you know, our entrepreneurship program. 
And that, exactly. And I love that. Um, you know, the, what does this have to do with me? I think we, I, <clears throat> is, is very much something we hear from kids. Heck, we hear it from adults too, right? <laughs> Plenty of things. What does that have to do with me? Um, but the idea that you can link across and, and give kids a bigger picture or your volunteers, Elizabeth, a bigger picture of what's really going on um, in this particular area of your community, in, in the um, experiences of your clients and the experiences of, of individuals around you, I think is really um, so significant. Um, I probably should have made this an hour and a half now that I'm thinking about it um, because we don't have too, too much time left. And of course, if there are any other um, questions or comments, please make sure to put those in Q&A or in the chat. Um, but in terms of the um, strategic planning, when it, when it comes to volunteers, you know, we, and certainly mentioned these, but I know that these are the ones people typically think of. We want this number of volunteers doing this type of work, you know, some of our outputs. But if you really look at, when we look at our next year of junior achievement or ICU baby, what are the things that you look at and say strategically, here's how we're gonna plan the incorporation of volunteers as a strategy versus just, not just, because it is important, we need this number of volunteers where the focus is just kind of the warm bodies, but how do you uh, build out what it means to have volunteers as a strategy when you're planning? Elizabeth? Sure, so- If that makes sense. It does, uh, absolutely. Um, with us, what we do is we, we're about ready to start strategic planning for next year. <laughs> um, so we're right in this conversation right now. And what we do is we first look at our programs, our end goals with regard to where we wanna move the needle as an organization. And once we identify our what the programs need as far as people power capacity, we kind of make a list of what the volunteer groups are that will help us fulfill each of those lists. So we have eight programs. Each of those programs has its own list of, as to how volunteers can help in, in that way. And then what we do after that is we identify which groups of volunteers could we, we just to narrow the field, which groups of volunteers could we recruit for those particular programs? We just started a youth ambassador um, program recently. So as I, I had mentioned to Jovita, one of the big things ICU Babies tackling is volunteer accessibility. We wanna make sure our, um, our volunteerism and our organization is accessible, not only to moms that have had an acute experience at all, we wanna make it more broad. And so what we've done is we've really looked to um, our youth that want to be involved to, to create this group. So they allow us to have capacity in some ways and they, they're skills based. They have a very unique experience, a very unique story um, to share in their work with us. So we take that group and we'll plug them into which program we think they can help with. Now, as far as some of the more um, skills based administrative work, we look to um, where our budget basically. So where do we have paid positions? What room do we have with paid positions as a smaller organization? And then where do we need to fill with um, skills-based volunteers that could be in the form of attorneys, which is one skill group of skills-based volunteers that we're using. But ironically, in, in this discussion, I, I had a, a conversation with a potential volunteer the other day and she said, I am excellent at Excel. And all I wanna do is run your Excel spreadsheets. I, you know, So I she fell on my desk, a golden egg and um, um, and so that is, so that is a, um, a capacity component. I know for sure that that's one of the things on the administrative side that we really do need. So basically to sum it up, programs down, where do we have our needs? And then looking at the administrative line, for example, I don't have someone to pay in my budget on PR. So we go ahead and recruit for PR uh, um, volunteer, someone that can donate their services in that way. Same with marketing. Um, and that's kind of how we flesh out. We yeah. look at needs and then we go from there. Got it. And work backwards. I think that's great. As opposed to sort of a sometimes um, um, maybe a, a slightly less um, um, strategic way where you really are just going, we, we need 100 volunteers this year, or that's what looks good, or that's what's going to um, kind of give us a sense of, the, of, of value as a program, really looking at it when it comes to your outcomes. Um, and again, that, that mission achievement strategy is um, it's huge. So Elise, how about you with uh, strategic planning? I couldn't have said it any better, Elizabeth. <laughs> <laughs> we do it the same way. 
Um, we look at where our, you know, our programs are. Uh, again, since we're only two uh, staff, our program manager you know, has to start planning um, for you know, each semester where our programs are gonna be. And then you know, how many volunteers are we going to need to bring those classes off? Um, but, you know, I did say that we don't hand out administrative jobs all the time, and, and that was a misspeak, because we do, um, and it kind of goes right back into the internships and expanding what you're, you're looking for in volunteers. So, again, we, we look for interns, because uh, we're lucky here in Tallahassee, we're surrounded by FS, Florida State University, <laughs> Go Knowles, um, FAMU, Florida Agriculture and Mechanical School, and TCC, uh, Flagler. Uh, so we have a large group of students, college students that we can look at. And so we're uh, looking, uh, we uh, ask for internships, volunteer-based in, in, internships, not only from the education departments, where they can help us uh, present classes, but do the, the administrative work we have to do by in, data entry, um, planning, you know, the whole nine yards that gives them some internship hours that they need for school. But we are also looking at the communications uh, uh, departments, marketing, because, uh, you know, that age group can handle doing social media much better than <laughs> than my age group. So we look at looking at them as well um, for those kinds of internships. And we're even now just opening it up into a little bit into the high schools. We've had some of our high school students that have been like through um, some of our high school programs that would like to give back and like to be able to uh, interact with the younger students because the younger students, boy, they think it's the beans to have <laughs> a high school student come in and interact with them. So it's just not, you know, those type of high level um, volunteers that we would like to work with, but we're, we're working with our, our high school and uh, college students as well to be able to do that. Um, but so that all goes into the strategic planning as to where uh, our programs are and where we can put those um, volunteers to help support those classes. And I will just, I, I think, I don't, I don't think either of these ladies would um, feel bad if I said this, but, you know, there are so many great ideas out there with our partner organizations, with organizations across the state, you know, visit the Junior Achievement website, visit the ICU Baby website, look at how they talk about their volunteers, look at how they um, present positions, um, you know, all of those things really can help give you ideas, um, those of you who are attendees, um, you know, especially if you get, I know it's easy to get stuck in a rut, we've got the same set of volunteer opportunities, we're not getting people, or we're hoping to expand, you know, um, part of the way that you do that is, of course, trainings and conversations like this, you know, but it's also uh, the relationships you have with other organizations. And then don't forget the volunteers themselves. Um, you know, there are times where you get the, the golden egg, like Elizabeth says, and somebody says, you know, I just, I love Excel, you know, um, or I love a finished product. So I'm willing to see how, do the things that, you know, the sausage is made in this way. I'm willing to do those things because I really want um, to see you all succeed in this space. You know, I think, again, there are many jobs, many things in our positions that we think are not desirable, or we think, you know, this is not something I want to do, so I want to hand it off. But really, it's in our communities, we have people with a variety of skills, passions, interests, who can create that synergy, similar to the word pivot, synergy, um, you know, for your organization, it can come from a lot of different um, um, spaces. Um, so things we think of that are maybe the things that are not um, appropriate for a volunteer or that are kind of off, off to the side sort of opportunities that nobody really wants. 
The point is, is it moving our organization forward? Is it valuable? And then allow people to take ownership of those things, you know? Um, so real quickly, I'm gonna look at this question in just a second, but real quickly um, from each of you, if you were speaking to a volunteer coordinator um, and they really feel like they have been kind of relegated to the side in their organizations, they don't really have um, a voice when it comes to um, the strategy of the organization. Volunteers are extremely beneficial and impactful, but um, they don't seem to have a, um, again, they're not incorporated into the strategy by senior management or, um, you know, they really aren't, they aren't, they don't have that, that space um, and that platform in their organizations, or maybe they want to grow the program and they just don't have um, that um, platform yet. You know, do you all have any ideas or advice for people if they are looking to, um, to move in that direction where they really elevate volunteerism to a strategy, not just as a, a program that is sort of, you know, again, relegated to the sidelines? Any thoughts? Me for sure. I, I can, <laughs> I think that um, volunteerism yields outcomes. And when you're leading an organization and you're constantly having to talk about and um, report your outcomes, um, volunteers are such a crucial component to that. They're driving the mission of the organization in a way that that money can't necessarily oftentimes. And I also think that sometimes what we miss um, with the importance of volunteerism is that they're really your ambassadors. They're going out to the community. So if you're not looking at the people power component, you're looking more at the funding. A lot of our volunteers come back and, and donate to us and they bring in big donors and they identify people in the community that say, you know, gosh, this little organization is doing such great work. And I would say about 20% of our donations come from volunteers going out into the community and amplifying our work. So I, not only in their tasks that they're able to do to really move the, the needle for us, but they're also just really incredible ambassadors. And I think that speaks volumes. Outcomes and ambassador amplify, those are all words we like to hear when we're growing an organization. And, and there's no way to do it without the um, volunteer base behind that. Thanks, Elizabeth. How yes. about you, Elise? Yeah, it's the same thing. Um, our volunteers, you know, not only the ones in the classrooms um, that uh, are representing JA um, with their passion as to their, you know, what they're teaching, uh, but they are also the ones on the board and they're the ones that, you know, are going out and um, being the ambassadors for us for asking for money, asking for volunteers, putting us together with grant writers, you know, with grant uh, possibilities. They're, you know, they are the ambassador for us. They, they take ownership of, you know, moving the needle for us to the next level and not just focusing on how many volunteers we have or how much money we're bringing in, but just, um, how much more we can make that difference in the community. And uh, we, you know, we couldn't, we wouldn't be here and doing as much as we are now without those volunteers. And it also goes back to um, the good experiences that they have because we have a phenomenal return rate um, on volunteers returning, but and again, just talking to them, uh, talking about the, our high school volunteers, they had such a wonderful experience with their volunteer and with their classroom. They um, they came back and they wanted to actually give back as well. Thank you all again. I should have made this an hour and a half. <laughs> the other ones were as well. Um, I did want to um, also just follow up. You know, our first two. Um, series sessions were all about shifting from program to strategy and then um, purpose-driven impact. So for any of you, you know, that question, great uh, perspective from Elizabeth and Elise, those two sessions really are deep dives into that, into that, um, you know, we hate that we have to do it, but lending that legitimacy and weight to our work. It has to be um, shared and translated 
uh, to people who may not see it as easily as we do. So those sessions are free and they will be uh, posted in the next week or two. I just want to thank Elizabeth and Elise. You all are just so extraordinary. Elise, we live close by, so we need to hang out. And Elizabeth, you just need to have reasons to come to Tallahassee to visit. Um, but both of these women, again, just do incredible work. I encourage you to go to the websites. Audrey posted those earlier. You can always just look them up on Google um, and, and see their organizations and the work that they do. We hope you'll join us next week for our last session in our volunteer engagement leadership, uh, leadership series. I uh, appreciate all the thanks and the um, in the uh, chat and as Audrey posted, all the recordings are gonna be available. Um, and uh, again, we hope you'll review our other sessions that this elevates and encourages you all as you hear what these incredible women are doing um, and will continue to do. We need all of you who are attending as well as you two, Elise and Elizabeth in our, in our state doing the work that you all are doing. So I hope everyone has a wonderful week. Sorry, we went over just a couple of minutes. Um, but we appreciate you all. Let us know uh, if there's any way that we can support you um, as, uh, as Volunteer Florida. Um, we love to be able to uh, encourage the field and provide the resources that you all need uh, to do your jobs well. So you all take care. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.